This week, we're going to be reading from Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you, brother. It's good being with all of you guys. Hope you guys are doing well, keeping safe. Hey, listen, we've been in a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer for the last four weeks and uh, four out of seven weeks. And uh, listen, I, I just want to share one conviction that I think the Lord placed on my heart this week um, as a, just a reminder. So this is not something that you don't know. It's something you obviously do. But I just wanted to remind you guys, um, what, when people, when pastors become pastors, so we have to go through a bit of an arduous process. You know, I, I went to grad, what is equivalent to graduate school for about six, six years and still pursuing a, an additional degree for the sole purpose of being able to lead well, minister well, love well, but more, perhaps more importantly than that, or as importantly, certainly, teach the Bible well and faithfully and accurately, right? And so um, this is something that, that I devote my life to, and, and pastors devote their whole lives to learning how to faithfully and truthfully preach the word. But the thing is, not all Christians go to school to learn how to receive God's will, God's word, rather, I'm sorry, uh, uh, faithfully, right? And so what you, what my hope is for you, uh, whether it's me preaching or someone else, regardless of whether you're this church or another church, is that you, you would get into this mindset whenever someone is handling the word of God, uh, that you would take on this responsibility and ownership of that time and you yourself lean in press in to that teaching time and don't wait for that communicator to articulate the truths of the Bible perfectly in the way that best and most perfectly fits your perspective and worldview, but instead that you would lean in and, and try to hear the voice of the Lord in that teaching and in that uh, preaching time. And so my invitation this morning, as it will be in, in any instance we gather together for worship, is that you would do a bit of a spiritual download on your own. Take the concepts you hear now that God gives you through his word. Take them home. Uh, well, you're, you are at home. You know, place them in your heart. Think about them. Allow the Lord to use them and unpack them throughout the week and, and do some work on your own, owning this time for yourself to allow the Lord to really capitalize on, on the sort of investment of the next 30 minutes. Does that make sense? So, so what, 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 I hope, what I hope you, uh, you know, how you perceive any kind of preaching time is that this is kind of a seed that the Lord wants to use to, to grow something in this week and maybe in this month or perhaps even in the course of the next year. And the work that needs to be put in really befalls on you to allow the Lord to do that. And so, um, yeah, having said that, again, we've been in a sermon series about the Lord's Prayer because we as a ministry and we as Christians are called to be prayerful and are called to pray. But here's the thing. I don't think a lot of people growing up in Sunday school, and some of you may have been going to church your entire life, I don't think everybody really understands what prayer is. And so what I have been communicating week to week for the last four weeks is this very concise, almost overly easy and summative definition of prayer, and that is this, that prayer is intimately connecting with all of God, with all of yourself. Prayer is not a transaction between uh, finite and infinite. It's not a transaction between mortal and immortal, between mortal being and divine being. It's an intimate connection. And the word I used in previous weeks was communion, community development with all of who God is and with all of your self. Prayer is not a religious thing that you could use to make yourself into a better person. Prayer doesn't, lots of prayer doesn't magically make you a holier person or more knowledgeable. Prayer, again, it's simply put, an intimate connection with all of who God is in the fullness of all that you are. And so if 
up until this point in your life, if you've only prayed requests, for instance, if all your prayers have sounded something along the lines of, God, please give me this. Oh, and please help me with this. And please give me that. Not to say you can't do that, because of course, absolutely you can. But if for years, and I'm talking to those who've been following Christ for some time now, if for years, that's all your prayers have been, and you've never prayed something along the lines of, God, I'm angry. God, I'm sad. God, I'm low. And you've, you've not gone deeper than just, God, give me. Then according to what Jesus is teaching in Matthew 6, here's, I don't know if that's prayer. That sounds a lot like deism. It sounds a lot like what the Greeks and Romans did when it came to Zeus and Poseidon. It sounds a lot like, well, in some other world religions, uh, I know some of my friends are uh, Hindus, and it sounds a lot like the way they pray. I have Muslim friends, and it sounds like the ways that they pray, too. It's a lot of requesting and kind of fearful, God, if you could please help me with this thing, and please help me with that thing. But when you look at prayer in the Bible, and you look at how Jesus prays, there are times where he asks for stuff, but <laughs> more often than not, it's confession. It's articulation. Read the book of Psalms. Those of you who've gone to church and are familiar with the Bible, read the book of Psalms and you see David's prayers. Yes, there's some requests and things in there, but how many times is David just like, God, this is my broken heart. This is my deep sense of loneliness. Here's all of my fear, and I'm articulating my fear to you. That's prayer. Prayer is an intimate like a child coming to a father, an intimate connection with the fullness of our cosmic creator in the fullness of who you are, with all your sin, with all your baggage, with all your brokenness, right? As Catherine mentioned earlier, with the fullness of your broken and battered and discouraged heart, it's coming before the, the Lord and saying, this, this is me. This is truly who I am. No sugarcoating, no barriers, no nothing else, no other fluff. It's This is just me. This is who I am. This is how I feel. This is what I'm thinking. That's what prayer is. And because that's what prayer is, we need help learning how to pray. And, and that's why we're studying the Lord's Prayer, because the Lord's Prayer is Jesus himself teaching us how to experience that, how to experience prayer in that way. This hugely cosmic connection needs some detail and, and some fleshing out, and thankfully Jesus does that through the Lord's Prayer. And so that's why he starts off his teaching about the Lord's Prayer by saying, first, you need to get the right posture, because if prayer is intimately connecting with the fullness of who God is, with the fullness of yourself, well, you better, you, you better get in the right posture and the right mindset, and the right mindset of prayer is, is a child coming before his or her father, not an employee coming to their employer, not a slave coming to their master, but it is a child, not an adult child, not an adolescent teenager. I mean a child, a little child in utmost dependency coming before his or her father with full vulnerability, with full transparency. So week one, we talked about that. When Jesus teaches us to pray and says, start your prayer with our Father in heaven, he's essentially saying, start off with the right posture. And once you have that right posture, the first thing you should pray is, hallowed be your name. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how the names of God are many throughout the Bible. But they each indicate an aspect of who God is. God is a provider. God is a protector. God is a comforter. God is a redeemer. And, and these aspects of God are revealed through the many names of God found in the Bible. And so when we hallow, when we make holy God's name, well, it means that only God and God alone is our protector, our redeemer, our comforter, our savior, our king. It's, it's, Entering into an intimate space and intentional space with God saying, God, only you are you in my life. None else. My college is not my college career and my best grades and having a sweet job that is not going to save me. That's not going to comfort and protect me. Those things are nice luxuries, but these are not not my redeemers. My only redeemer is you. 
Jesus. And that's what it means to hallow his name. And that's the first thing Jesus tells us to pray is to make sure that you're entering into and, and using intimate language to God that you're confessing, hey, as much as you have loved just me and you are entering into an intimate relationship and you're faithful and loyal to just me, I also want to be faithful and loyal to just you, no other gods but you. And then last week, we talked about as much as we have the access and uh, freedom to do that, to come vulnerably and intimately before the Lord, because God is also our king, not just our father, we come before him with a sense of humility and a sense of obedience, right? When we pray, uh, your kingdom come, we're praying, here is what I deeply want. However, not by my will, your will. Although this is this seems like a great thing, and I'm praying that you would grant me this awesome thing, a job or whatever, access, entry into this college, as much as I really want this, and it seems like a good thing. If that's not your will, God, then let your will be done. Your kingdom, your authority, may your authority have ultimate reign in my life. Now, we're you're going to now talk about the next sort of request in the Lord's Prayer, and it's going to sort of expand on what we talked about last week, because if you read in, in context, your kingdom come is applied and sort of attached to also this portion of the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, we, can, we can honestly spend like a month, two months, just on a sermon series on this little portion of the Lord's Prayer alone, because it's so in-depth, and it has a lot of implications to it. But we're just going to do a very, very general study and general application of this verse, okay? And that general study and application begins with us asking and thinking about this question. Have you ever asked yourself, what is God's will for my life? If you're a Christian, if you follow, actually, even if you're not a Christian, you have probably asked yourself this question. If you're a little younger and you feel like, why? I've never really asked that. Just wait, this question is going to haunt you as you get older and older. And in fact, your senior year, you're about to get to college and you're like, well, what college are you going to? I don't know. God, I wish you would just tell me. You get to college and you have to choose a major. You're like, God, I don't know what to major was. God, I wish you would tell me. You find, you know, you start meeting people and making friends and then you find someone you want to date. And you're like, do I date this person or that person or whatever? And God, I wish you would tell me so forth. And so in my now 15 years of ministry, every single Christian that I've met has struggled with this question at least one point in their life or another. And the top two sort of question, particular questions as it relates to God's will that I've come across first are, number one, what do I major in or what career do I pursue? And the second one, you can probably guess it. In fact, anyone in this room want to guess? What do you think is the second most popular question as it pertains to God's will? The first is, what do I major in or what do I do for my work? What do you think the second one is? Or even at home. Yes, excellent. It's who do I date or who do I marry, right? And these are the two questions that sort of just totally intensify and capture every single Christian mindset, especially as, as, you're, as you get a little older, especially if you're in late high school, college, right? These two questions are constantly what I think Christians are wrestling over. And I think Christians often wrestle with these two questions, plus a plethora of others, as it pertains to God's will is because, if we're honest with ourselves, we, I mean, again, you got to be real honest and dig a little deep. If we're honest with ourselves, I feel like most Christians have this very interesting perspective of God's will. I think most Christians believe that God has a very special and unique will for our lives. And if you make too many mistakes, if you don't really press in and listen to the voice of God, you can miss out on this spectacular, singular will that God has for your life. And me growing up, too, I, that's what I heard when I went to church. Stories that would uh, emphasize and enable this kind of perspective of God's will were, were plentiful. And so I remember when I was in middle school or high school, I, one of the pastors that I knew at that time would, would always tell us this story about how he met his wife. And he would say, you know, he was praying for his wife one day and God gave him this sort of vision for this 
very particular type of woman. And, and so he woke up after having this dream or vision and wrote down the attributes of this <laughs> woman that he envisioned. And it was like 25 characteristics of this woman. And then later on, he had another vision that added to that original vision. And, and God even, sounds crazy, but God even told him the, the dress size of the woman that he eventually would marry. So he went out and bought a dress in that size, thinking and feeling, believing that, I don't know, God told me that this is the type of woman I'm going to marry. He, eventually, a couple of years later, he meets a woman exactly like that. And it's just like, and then it was happy ever after or whatever. Growing up with stories like that, that's how I thought God's will was, right? I thought God's will was like this perfect, singular, oh, you better, you better be careful not to deviate left to right and sin too much because God's got this perfect, singular plan for what you're going to do for a living, for who you're going to marry, for where you're going to live, for how many kids and what kind of kids, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, you know, many Christians, they honestly carry around with them this sense of like, existential FOMO, you know what I mean? Like Christians carry around the sense of like, oh, if I, if I don't play my cards right, if I don't obey enough, if I don't trust, if I don't go to church and tithe and serve, whatever, all these things, then I might miss out on God's perfect singular plan for my life. But here's the thing. Nowhere in the Bible, in the entire Bible, does God's will ever is God's will ever communicated in this way. There is a, not a single instance in the Bible where God says, I have this special plan for you. And there's, there's ways as Christians we can misconstrue and sort of pervert God's word to make it sound like this. But in context, there's not a single verse or a single place in the Bible where God teaches us that he has this magical, perfect will and it's your job as a Christ follower and God believer to not only discover what that will is somehow through enough righteousness and through enough obedience, but it's also up to you to obey that perfect will. Otherwise, you're out of luck. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on the best version of your life. The Bible, when it comes to God's will, actually not only does not say this, but in brevity, the way that the Bible teaches us about God's will can be summarized like this. There's two types of God's will. And we've talked about this before, um, but we're just going to review. Maybe there's new information for some of you. The first type of God's will is what we call God's decreed will. And the second is called God's perceived will. God's decreed will is sort of, you know, this is human. This is time all of time, the beginning and the end of time. God's decreed will is all that he does singularly in all of time. And so as a being who exists outside of time, who's not contingent upon time, but we could even say based on Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, meaning someone created a beginning. And in Revelations, we see there is an end. Someone creates an end. And so uh, God himself, we can assume and assert from that verse, creates time itself, creates space along with it. And so when it comes to, just think kind of esoterically here, say, when it comes to time, all of time, God sees all of time as one complete unit. You and I, we see time linearly. We see it by units, right? One second, two second, three second, and we cannot see an hour in one moment. We, we can think back on hours that occurred, but we can't think of time in that manner, right? God, however, in seeing all of time, every single moment that ever exists at, at all times, can see it just happening all moments together. He decrees and he controls what happens in each and every single moment, even if it's seemingly bad stuff that happens, God's word tells us that nothing can happen outside of God's decreed will. The way that Moses writes about this in Deuteronomy 19, he says, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of his law. So there is this secret will. There is a, a will that's beyond our understanding. We'll never, ever be able to understand it. We'll never be able to uh, discover it and contain it. It's just God's out-of-time decreed will. 
So whatever happens, happens because God decreed it to happen. God's perceived will, on the other hand, is uh, our perspective of God's decreed will in a given time. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm losing some of you guys. It's, it's our understanding of God's decreed will in a short given amount of time. And the place really we, we see God's perceived will, I would say ultimately, let alone exclusively, is in God's word, right? This is God speaking to Micah. He says, which is recorded in God's word, says, God says, uh, he has told you, or uh, yeah, he has told you, oh man, what is good. And what, the, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, right? So in other words, God's decreed will is found ultimately in, in history and circumstances. So your race, your gender, uh, who your parents are, who, who your siblings are, where you live, what century you live in, what, what country you live in and what that country looks like, that's all a product of God's decreed will. If it exists, if it happened, God allowed it and in many ways made it happen. Again, even if it's something unfortunate and painful, we don't maybe not understand exactly why God did that, did that but we, we know according to the Bible that God did do that. But God's perceived will is ultimately found in Scripture because it's, that's what we can understand in our singular moment of time, what God wills for us. In other life group sessions, this is what we call God's will of desire, right? I don't know if you guys remember that. So in some sense, God's decreed will gives us the parameters for our decisions, right? Because we, we can't, if I'm, I'm born as me, a male, Philip Lee, Asian American, I cannot make a decision not as myself. So it gives me the parameters, all right? I have to make a decision within my own, within the things that I couldn't, cannot change, that just exist. But God's perceived will, and by the way, God's, again, decreed will, we can never fully understand. We just, we don't know why things happen, ultimately why, you know, uh, we don't know ultimately what will happen, right? That's God's decreed will. But God's perceived will, we can understand. And actually, we can also disobey God's perceived will, because God reveals his sort of uh, desires and what he wants in his word, and we can hear that and see that, and we can absolutely disobey it, right? Or again, God's decreed will cannot be changed nor fully known, regardless of how good or evil it is, the uh, evil, the history or circumstance of it is, okay? We will never understand God's decreed will, why things happen the, the way they happen, but we can understand God's perceived will, and we can choose to obey this perceived will or not. And really the role of the Holy Spirit as a parenthetical point is to help us obey God's perceived will. So again, there is no magical will for your life that God's like, you better follow this. If you don't, then you're screwed. There is God's decreed will, which is all of human history is already known. God knows all of time in an instant. He knows everything. But you as a finite person and me, we'll never understand that. We'll never be able to extract that or pray hard enough for God to reveal that. We'll never know. All we know is God's perceived will, what he has allowed us to understand in the finite time that we have on this planet through his word. And so there are many places in God's word where we see sort of this flushed out. I'm just going to share with you one really profound place where we see this. This is in Proverbs chapter 16. And Solomon, King Solomon writes this. The plans of the heart belong to man. Okay. Okay, you get that. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So you have your intentions and plans in your heart. But ultimately what happens, what manifests itself, that comes from God my right paradox wow what verse two all the ways of a man are pure to his own eyes but the lord weighs the spirit again there's i have this free will to kind of do what i what i wish to do I, I see god's perceived will i can obey or not but ultimately god's decreed will is gonna happen this is, this is kind of blind blowing right and so therefore solomon says commit your work to the lord and your plans will be established even we can get into that too. What does that even mean? Okay, verse four, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Again, will of decree, 
Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will go unpunished. Be steadf- uh, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is, a, is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. So, and again, in verse 9, he says, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Okay, this is a lot in this crazy, crazy Proverbs. Let me just share with you a couple of things, okay? What this means is, number one, this does not, or rather what it doesn't mean, is that your decisions, this does not mean that your decisions do not have consequences, okay? Yes, God ultimately decrees what will happen, and you can't change it, you can't know it. But because he has given you his perceived will, he has told you clearly what he wants you to do, you have to pay for the consequences of your decisions. It's a paradox. I understand, well, well, yeah, but if God is ultimately going to have his way, why why am I going to be held accountable for my decisions? I I cannot explain to you. I don't know. The Bible cannot really articulate that because you're we, we cannot help but see time as linear. So we're literally incapable of understanding why they does that. But we do know that the Bible is clear about your responsibility, about your accountability, about the consequences of your decisions, right? Number two, what this also doesn't mean, this doesn't mean, therefore, that you are a pre-programmed robot, and so your life has no meaning. Because The writer of Proverbs, King Solomon said that. He said, we have the freedom to establish plans. You can make plans to do whatever you want to do. Ultimately, God's will is going to be God's will. But you have the freedom and the choice to do what you want to do. And in fact, uh, we see numerous examples of God changing his perceived will or adjusting his perceived will as a reflection of his decreed will. Again, his decreed will doesn't change. It is permanent and it's unknowable, but his perceived will will fluctuate. So this is in Numbers chapter 14. Moses said to the Lord, please pardon the iniquity of the people according to the gracious uh, greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. And what does it say? Verse 20, then the Lord said, okay, because you have prayed that in response to my perceived will, God says, I have pardoned according to your word. Isn't that crazy? That means in God's perceived will, there's there's room for flexibility. There's responsibility. There's response. God's decreed will is not going to change. But in his decreed will, God even understands. God even knows if you repent and how God will use that repentance. God already knows if you sin, God already knows how he will use that sin to either teach you a lesson or or to bring you back to the full. He already knows all that. But in his perceived will, from our perspective of him, look at this. This is crazy. He's willing to even adapt and adjust. And lastly, what does this not mean? This does not mean that you have full control over your life. So there's this paradoxical balance, right? It's God's will will ultimately be done because he has a decreed will. But there is another will that he has clearly articulated to you through his word predominantly that you have the responsibility of fulfilling or either not fulfilling. So what does it mean, therefore, when we pray? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. (laughs) Again, like this is what I'm saying. We could go weeks on this. This is crazy. This The implications of what Jesus is asking us to pray here are super in-depth. But let's just talk about three practical things that Jesus is trying to teach us in teaching us to pray this one, one aspect of the Lord's Prayer. Number one, it means that we are to thank God for his decreed will. For those of you who have been part of our, our life group on Wednesdays and Thursdays, that's why uh, if you ever think like, it, um, this may be a first for you, but I, I prayed for the last several weeks, God, thank you for making me a Korean American, Asian American. Thank you for our Asian American identity, because that's a celebration of God's decreed will. Uh, do you have parents? Thank the Lord for your parents. That's part of his decreed will. Do you have siblings? You didn't have a choice in that. You didn't have any say. They just are. They just exist. Thank the Lord for that. So the first thing that Jesus is trying to teach us by teaching us to pray, your will be done on earth as in heaven. He's teaching us as good as God's decreed will in essence has, has produced the goodness of heaven. So his decreed will is producing all the things that are happening on earth. 
And you may not think so, because you, you may not think that your siblings are nice or your parents are nice, yet nonetheless, because they exist in time, God, that's all part of God's will. And so the first layer of, of praying your will be done on earth as in heaven is, God, I don't understand it, but thank you for your will. Uh, whatever has happened has happened for a purpose. As much as everything in heaven is created and happens for a purpose, everything on earth happens for a purpose, ultimately. So God, I don't understand it, but thank you. As a parenthetical point, therefore, for some of you who feel like, man, I really wish I was born a different person. Man, I really wish I had different parents. Man, I wish I wasn't born in this city. And that that's all just lies and temptations that the enemy wants to use to get you to be discontent in the Lord. The first layer of this prayer is understand the goodness of God's will and celebrate that decreed will. The second thing that this verse or in this sort of as part of the Lord's prayer is teaching us to pray is help me understand. When I pray, Lord, your will be done on earth as in heaven. The second layer to that is, is me sort of asking God, will you help me understand your perceived will? Uh, because it's in the Bible, and the Bible is long, and the Bible is big, and it's complex, and sometimes it seems convoluted. So will you help me to understand your perceived will? And this is where a lot of Christians, I think, they get things wrong. When they come to Lord, the Lord in prayer, when they're applying to colleges, the first question, and the, really the first kind of prayer I see a lot of Christians pray is, God, I, I, I know that I, I feel like I need to go to this college or this college. Will you please tell me which college to go to? They don't ask the question, God, is college your will? They ask the question, which of these two options? Which of these three options is your will? Really, what you have just done is pigeonholed God's will, haven't you? You've taken possibly God's uh, decreed will and perceived will, and you've all just kind of shoved it into three options that you have created for yourself. And so the second layer to this prayer is, God, I, I want to fully understand what is your, what is your perceived will? Uh, is your will for me to even go to call? Is that your call for me? Uh, I've grown up, you know, when I was young, my, both my dad and my brother were computer scientists. So I just assumed that I was supposed to go to computer science, but I never really prayed, is that God's will? I just assumed it. And I really wasted a lot of time and did a lot of damage to my ego because this is not my gift set, not spending the time praying, God, what is your perceived will? And I really, if I went to scripture, then what I would have found is that, no, it doesn't, no, God's gift is different. God, God's calling can be totally different than your parents or whatever, right? So the second layer to this prayer is help me understand your perceived will. And then the third sort of general meaning behind this prayer, the third meaning behind praying your will be done on earth as in heaven is, God, now that I understand your perceived will, having gone to scripture and really having allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to me through scripture, will you empower me to do it? Will you empower me and help me to actually obey? Right? So here's what that means. Um, God is not going to tell you who to date. You do know that who you date is part of God's decree will, because you cannot meet anybody outside of the people that God wants you to meet, right? So you understand that part at least. But when it comes, let's say you're, you're a guy and you're thinking about, oh, do I date this person or this person? God is not going to tell you in his perceived will, he's not going to tell you that A is better than B, right? But he will tell you what are wise ways to go about having relationships, I'm not going to say dating because dating is not in the Bible, but he does tell you how, what kind of a man to be, for instance, what kind of woman to be. He does tell you what kind of family to establish. He does tell you uh, what are good characteristics and traits that will help produce fruitfulness in your life. He's not going to tell you, oh, Sally is better than Cindy, but he will tell you, here is what godliness looks like, and here's how to implement and practice that. God is not going to tell you whether you should go to this college or that college. He may close the doors and, and, circum and through his decreed will, things may happen where a door shuts and God has really made it convenient for you. But sometimes he's not going to tell you this college is better than that college. He's not going to tell you this major is better than that major. But he does tell you how to go about worshiping him regardless of where you're at or what you do. 
He does tell you how to be a good student, right? And so in, in, in that kind of perspective, when you take that understanding of God's will into your life, your life actually becomes much more free. You don't need to obsess over, oh, did I make the right choice? Oh, my goodness. I remember when I graduated college or towards as I was graduating college, my mentors during college were all alumni from one graduate school in California called Westminster Theological Seminary. And they had hyped up this grad school to me for years. And so I thought that God's magical will was clearly that I go to this grad school. And so I applied and I got in. And that was like, a, a, I took that as a sign of like, oh, that's, that's God's will, I got in. And then I applied to a job. Was just, I was in Colorado at the time, and this uh, graduate school is in SoCal. And so I applied to a church in SoCal, and they flew me out. I interviewed and everything, and I, they, offered, they offered the job to me. I was like, oh, step number two, God's will, confirm, boom. And then I found cheap, cheap housing, which in LA is, is like an oxymoron, right? And it was awesome. And I was like, oh, that's God's will. Had I spent the time to really ask the Lord, help me understand, first of all, your perceived will in scripture and give me the courage to obey it, then what I would have realized is while I was, yes, discipled by these folks and while this grad school was getting hyped up for years while I was in college, my mother was struggling from a rare heart condition that actually, uh, if unchecked, would have maybe led to her untimely, untimely death. And so... If I spent the time reading scripture, I would have come to verses like 1 Timothy 5, 18, where, where Paul says, if you don't take care of your household, you're worse than an unbeliever. Uh, I would have, I, had I not, had I taken the time to sit under God's perceived will in scripture, I would have learned like, here's what godly manhood looks like. You have to lead and protect and guard your family. Then I would have I've been like, oh, that's cool that God in his decreed will sent me these mentors and stuff, but clearly his perceived will is right here. When it came to dating relations too, same thing. If I had just sat under God's word, I would have realized and he would have clearly told me, here's really the kinds of people you don't want to marry, right? If you're a Christian, you, you, you cannot marry a non-Christian, or right? you wish you marry somebody that compliments you and then it's something like that produces a good, fruitful Christian family, right? It's your ultimate perspective because when you die and go to heaven, you want to be able to you know, see your children and see your spouse in heaven and we want to worship together as one family. But I didn't really spend the time thinking about that. I just was thinking more so like, well, what is available? Well, oh, she likes me back? That must be God's will, right? So in many ways, praying your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven, my friends, it's probably the hardest part of the Lord's prayer because it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where you get God's cosmic kingship and God's cosmic goodness colliding together into your obedience or disobedience. And that's what makes it so difficult. But when you're challenged and pressed, when you feel pressure, when it comes to obeying God's will, just know this. The culmination of God's will produced and the climax of God's decreed will produced a savior who died on a cross for you. And ain't no college, ain't no girlfriend or boyfriend, ain't no car or career going to die on a cross for you. But in God's will, so Jesus did. Who better to give your obedience to than he? Who better to give your will over to than he? You know, let me close with this. C.S. Lewis is a profound and yet kind of a scary sentiment. He says this in one of his books. He says, at the end of the day, really at the end of time, there's only going to be two people, two kinds of people. The first kind of people who say, my will be done, to which God will say, okay, your will be done. Go and your will be done for all eternity then. Or those who say, thy will be done. And to them, he says, come on in, come on in. Will you pray this challenging, challenging prayer this week? Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Your kingdom come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I ask that you would um, give us the wisdom to be able to not obsess over some kind of magical will that we that possibly you have for us.
and thinking about, oh, this is the right person, this is the right, but let us just think about the confidence um, that Christ carried with him. He knew that uh, you're ultimately in control of all things, and therefore, what really, ha what really is more important than um, who and what and when, in many ways, what's more important is how. Uh, how do we date? How do we study? How do we work as people who work? How, um, you know, let's not obsess over, oh, I wish I had different parents or a different family, but let us focus more on what your perceived will has said. How do I be a good son or a good daughter? How do I be a good brother or sister? How do I be a good friend? Because that's, that's really what Jesus was much more concerned with, with as well. He didn't care necessarily about uh, where and what exactly he would do, but he knew how he would go about doing it. And so I pray. Help us to do the same, knowing that your will ultimately produce salvation for us, and therefore it's good enough for us to give ourselves over to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to continue in worship. Uh, why don't you take this next moment, and as we sing this song, just respond. And I love this chorus especially because it says, oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better uh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Man, if you believe that in your heart, will you make this your prayer and sing it out? <laughs> 